using Michael Quinn Patton. We had tried to get him at the first evaluation conclave, but he was booked up, had a conflict, and so it's so great that we have him um, with us here today by video. Um, you have his bio in your, in your book, so I'm not going to sort of read it out to you. You can go and, and learn more about him, <laughs> though I, I think many of you probably know him and his work. Among other things, he was the former president of the American Evaluation Association. He's received many awards for his achievements over the course of his career in evaluation. He's written six books. I have a few of them, um, Utilization-Focused Evaluation, Qualitative Research and Evaluation, Developmental Evaluation. And I can tell you my copies were very dog-eared. And in fact, you know, I had a, at my previous job, I had a shelf of evaluation books, sort of a little library, and people, colleagues would come and sort of take the books and borrow them. And, and um, But, you know, I didn't want them to take Michael's books because <laughs> I liked having them close. So I ended up getting extra copies of, of his books so I could have those on the shelf. So people, and I sort of hoarded my copies. And so I never had to worry that I'd sort of not have it at, ha at hand. Um, his contributions to evaluation theory are massive. Um, his ideas are so embedded now uh, in our work. When we hear people talking about, you know, what's the use of this evaluation? Who's going to use it? Who, who are the users? I mean, um, his contributions to evaluation theory have really permeated, I think, the way that we, we approach evaluation. But, you know, it's also just such a thrill to be introducing him because he's, he's such a lovely person. Um, we were talking last night, a few of us, uh, at the end of the day, uh, about how we came to evaluation. And I think many of us, you know, it wasn't a sort of uh, linear route. I mean, for many of us, it was people that we met, you know, mentors or, or just people who were working in the field of evaluation who kind of gave us our first job or brought us in and we sort of, you know, it was those people um, that really brought us in. And, and certainly there was a person in my life uh, who, who did that for me, that was Terry Smitillo, um, who incidentally loves music, as does Michael Quinn Patton. So I wonder if there's some connection there, of sort of some of the greatest evaluators maybe are the most inspiring also will pick up a guitar and, and sing about evaluation. But so there's, there's the people that we meet, and then there's other people that you first meet through their writing. And um, there's several people here in the audience that I certainly first met through their writing. And I think one of the, the sort of real thrills or the really cool thing about evaluation is that it's such a young field. And so, I'm, I mean, I remember the first time I went to, I think it was, uh, was the American Evaluation Conference or maybe it was the joint AEA-CEA conference. And I remember I'd read all of these theorists and, and writers and I remember sort of how cool it was to sort of see them walking around and you'd hear sort of people whispering, sort of the other young new evaluators. Oh my God. You know, and sort of, shall I go and talk to him? I think I'm going to go and talk to him. And, um, you know, so he was always sort of, and, and he and many others were always sort of surrounded by this sort of group of young people. And, you know, and he always just was so uh, gracious in answering questions and, and just, I'm um, such a wonderful person. Um, so for those of you who haven't had the chance to meet him, it's such a, it's, it's, it's so great that he, the Conclave can be a place where you're being introduced to him and, and his work. Um, so for me, first, I, I met him through his writing. Uh, then I met him at conferences, uh, then had an opportunity to work with him. And each time that I've, I've, you know, interacted with him or heard him speak, I've learned something new about how to be a better evaluator, about why evaluation matters. He's, he's definitely up there, I would say, in the top sort of three influences on my, my own thinking about evaluation. Um, there's a quote that, um, if I could ask Aditi to throw it on, and I'm sure many others kind of have this quote, and I, um, okay, can you see it? Okay. I'm going to walk over there and I'm going to read it out to you. And what I did was, you know, I had clipped it out and I had put it on my bulletin board at work. Oh, here we go. <coughs> so it's a little bit long, but if you, will, uh, if you will let me read it out. So I had clipped out this quote from Michael Patton and I'd stuck it on my bulletin board. And it says, I practice and write about evaluation because I believe that evaluative thinking can make more effective those who are deeply committed to and authentically engaged in making the world a better place. Evaluation at its best distinguishes what works from what doesn't 
and helps separate effective change makers from resource wasters, boastful charlatans, incompetent meddlers, and corrupt self-servers. Through evaluation, I aspire to make my own small contribution toward realizing the vision of an experimenting global community, one characterized by commitment to reality testing, respect for different perspectives, and open dialogue about evidence, a world in which ongoing learning is valued and practiced and knowledge is generated and used. So I had, I had posted that on my bulletin board. And I remember my, my former boss, who was not in evaluation, but who was sort of the regional director of our office, and he was a bit of a um, you know, very smart guy, I really liked him, a bit of a curmudgeon though, and he came in, and I remember him sitting down and sort of seeing this, you know, this, this statement on my board, and he said, wow, it's like a cult with you guys, you know, in the evaluation unit, you know, you're part of this cult. And I sort of smiled, and of course I thought, yes, and you will be joining the cult soon. <laughs> but you know, it's not a cult, it's a movement. And you know, I go back to this, I, I kept it on my board for probably I mean, years and years, and when I left that office I packed it up and put it away and put it, put it on top of my, my new desk. And I go back to it all the time when I'm unsure or when I need to be grounded or when I'm trying to sort of think about whether I should take something on or not. Um, you know, certainly I had a different keynote speech, for example, for those of you who were here for my keynote. And this was one of the things I went back to when I thought about changing it. And I thought, yeah, no, I want to change it. I want to talk about something that I think is a bit more relevant. So, again, I know you're probably thinking, God, let him speak, you know, <laughs> stop talking. So I will. Um, I won't sort of stand any longer between you and, and, and Michael Patton. But just a few points. Um, the broadcast is one way. So. Uh, when he's presenting and speaking, he can't hear us. So what we're going to do, though, at the end, we're going to do two rounds of questions. So he, he's going to speak for about 30 minutes. Um, you'll probably get a sense of when he's nearing the end. So I'd ask those who are going to ask questions to sort of make, try and make your way to the front. I'll take five questions, uh, which he'll sort of have typed in. And then he'll respond to those. And then again, we'll take another five questions. So. For those of you who are, sort of have a burning desire to ask questions, think about making your way up to the front so that we can do that smoothly. So without any further ado, I am handing over to Michael Quinn Patton for his keynote address on innovative directions for evaluation of development. That wonderful introduction. And let me say that I've had the opportunity to view your keynote address earlier in the conference, which I found <coughs> very inspiring. And the memorable phrase of measuring what you treasure and making evaluation matter. And the issues that you raised are certainly global issues. In the centerpiece of the American press uh, today, is a report that one in five American women report being sexually assaulted and that one in three women serving in the US military report being raped. So that the issues that you raised are indeed global issues and the, those statistics are having an impact on US policy because um, this week the US Congress has been deliberating a bill on a Violence Against Women Act, um, and it is those statistics that have been propelling them to take action on that issue. So at a global level, the, the way in which you so powerfully describe the importance of bringing data to bear on these important issues and keeping them before policymakers and the public uh, resonates uh, worldwide. What I want to do is take you through in this opportunity to, uh, uh, to reflect together, and I very much regret that I can't be there in person. Uh, I've got a number of friends who I would have loved to spend time there with, as well as meet many of, of the rest of you, uh, but it didn't work out, and so I, I thank the organizers for making this virtual presentation possible. There's been a lot of behind-the-scenes work to um, organize this and uh, make sure that the technology worked, and I'm in their debt for making it possible for me to participate in this way. What I'm going to do is share with you 10 innovative developments that I find particularly compelling at this time. Um, 
and I'll go through these uh, fairly quickly, uh, but to give you a taste of, of what is impressing me about how our profession has developed, and use this to invite you as you continue to interact at the conference to share with each other your own uh, sense of what the important innovative developments are, as you have been doing uh, throughout the conference. The first one is the globalization of our professional networks and associations themselves, which you uh, represent with this evaluation conclave. And as you heard from Marco earlier in the, the, the conference with the work through eval partners, they found 158 voluntary organizations for professional evaluation, uh, 110 countries with professional evaluation associations, 23 regional organizations, this, much of this has happened in the last decade, and much of it is due to people uh, who are at the, at the conclave and who've helped organize the conclave, and indeed the conclave is an example of that. So the global uh, context of evaluation is, sets the stage for the other nine innovations that I want to discuss. And as the field has developed over the last 40 years, which is the uh, time that I've been practicing <coughs> evaluation, we've moved from a project and program focus to a number of new and emergent frameworks and criteria for conducting evaluation that I think are especially germane in the development uh, world context. And I just want to go through a few of these and their implications, beginning with um, evaluating the implementation of principles rather than projects or programs. I had the opportunity over the last two years to do an evaluation of the evaluation of the Paris Declaration. And the Paris Declaration exemplifies this approach. Now, I want to take a, a couple minutes to take you through that for those who may not be familiar with the Paris Declaration. Um, the Paris Declaration on Aid Effectiveness was a landmark international agreement and program of reform, uh, the culmination of several decades of attempt to improve the quality of aid and its impacts beginning in the 1980s. The Paris Declaration on Aid Effectiveness was endorsed in 2005 uh, by over 100 in, uh, countries, including more developed aid donor countries, developing countries from around the world, and international development. Uh, institutions, and picking up on, again, Catherine's theme of relevance from her keynote, the stakes for the Paris Declaration and for the aid effectiveness are huge. The critical need for better lives for billions of people, reflected, as she pointed out, in the approaching Millennium Development Goals for 2015, hundreds of billions of dollars committed to addressing poverty reduction, a web of international relationships, and growing, often skeptical, demands from many sides to see demonstrable results from development aid. The Paris Declaration was therefore important both for accountability, assessing the reforms achieved or not achieved, and for learning to guide future development efforts. There are five Paris Declaration principles. Increased country ownership of the development agenda, alignment between donor agendas and country agendas, harmonization of aid approaches internationally and domestically in countries, mutual accountability between donors and receiving companies, and managing for results. The declaration itself pledged an independent evaluation, itself a tool of accountability, and a fully joint evaluation was conducted over four years. Uh, I got involved in, in phase two from 2009 to 2011, which involved 22 country-level evaluations led by partner countries and managed in-country, 18 donor international headquarters studies, and seven supplementary studies on key topics, plus review of the most significant global literature. You see here the 22 countries that were involved in the Paris Declaration evaluation. These reports are available on the Paris Declaration Evaluation website of the OECD, um, as well as is the full report of the Paris uh, Declaration Evaluation. Seven Asian countries were involved among the 22, including Nepal, 
And as I said, you can find all of those reports online. The key valuation questions were, what are the important factors that have affected the relevance and implementation of the Paris Declaration and its potential on aid effectiveness and development results? To what extent and how has the implementation of the Paris Declaration led to an improvement in the efficiency of aid delivery, the management and use of aid, and better partnerships? And has the implementation of the Paris Declaration strengthened the contribution of aid to sustainable development results? And if so, how? Attending to development outcomes. <clears throat> the building blocks of the evaluation then included country studies, donor studies, supplementary studies, answering these three major evaluation questions, and ultimately a synthesis report that put all of that together. The findings were that country ownership had advanced farthest, that alignment and harmonization improved unevenly, that mutual accountability and managing for results lagged the most, and here is particularly a message to those of us engaged in evaluation and those of you participating in the conclave, that action, action on mutual accountability is now the most important need, backed by transparency and a realistic acceptance and management of risks. Let me turn now to another important framework. So we've looked at principles as a framework. A related framework is human rights as an evaluation framework. And this connects deeply to the message that Catherine brought to the opening of the conclave that includes women's rights and children's rights. And one of the leaders in this movement over the last decade has been Mahesh Patel and his work with UNICEF on advancing human rights as an emergent development paradigm as well as an evaluation paradigm and approach. Looking at the different human rights conventions over the last 50 plus years, um, including the 1979 Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination Against Women, including violence, and the 1989 Convention on the Rights of the Child. What these conventions provide is a set of criteria um, for evaluating the extent to which countries, projects, and donors are living up to, to these rights. Another important framework is sustainability, uh, evaluating sustainability as both criteria um, and a framework for development. Uh, yet another that I'm finding a lot of interest in is evaluating strategies. I find a lot of uh, donors, international agencies, and philanthropic funders are interested in evaluating strategy as an evaluator. And a volume of new directions for evaluation was devoted to evaluating strategy. Um, and finally, a systems change. Evaluating systems change is quite a different challenge from evaluating a project or a program. And so what each of these different innovative frameworks and new units of analysis and new evaluators, uh, to use our jargon, pose new challenges for evaluation designs, for evaluation methods, for evaluation reporting, for evaluation engagement, and for work with stakeholders. Uh, these new directions are being driven by the fact that people working in development are thinking about develop development itself in new ways, around principles, around human rights, uh, around sustainability, uh, around systems change, around strategy. Um, and our challenge as evaluators is to be able to answer the questions that they bring to development from these new kinds of frameworks. And in doing so, the importance of joint evaluations come to the fore. The evaluation network of the Development Evaluation Assistance Committee, DAP, of the OECD aimed to contribute to improved development effectiveness by supporting robust, informed, and independent evaluation. Among other things, the evaluation network encourages harmonization and standardization of the evaluation program and facilitates joint evaluations. It has been promoting more joint evaluation work in line with the DAC's broader agenda on enhancing donor coordination and collaboration between developers development agencies, and partner countries in the developing world, 
all of which are in accordance with the principles of the Paris Declaration on Development Aid. The first major joint evaluation was the uh, evaluation of the international response to the conflict and genocide in Rwanda. That major groundbreaking synthesis report came out in 1997. Shortly thereafter, the multi-agency evaluation of the Rwanda genocide evaluation, the Active Learning Network for Accountability and Performance in Humanitarian Action, ALNAP, was established. And in 2008, ALNAP published a meta-evaluation, an overview synthesis of 18 joint evaluation reports entitled Meta-Evaluation, Joint Evaluations Coming of Age, the Quality and Future Scope of Joint Evaluations. And in that report, they note, quote, there has been a growing trend towards jointness in the aid world and joint evaluations of humanitarian action in particular. Originally champion, championed by donor governments, joint eva evaluations have been the focus of recent and growing interest and engagement from NGOs and UN agencies. In 2005 and 6, the second ever systematic system-wide evaluation of humanitarian action took place. The international response to the Indian Ocean tsunami of 2004 through the Tsunami Evaluation Coalition. And I suspect there are people there in the audience who were a part of that. The sector, the report goes on to say, the sector is on a steep learning curve in terms of how to do joint evaluations, including how best to manage and organize in them, when they are appropriate, and with whom. The Paris Declaration evaluation then was an exemplar of a joint evaluation. It had an international reference group, a stakeholder group of over 40 representatives from around the world. The management group uh, was made up of participants and policymakers from Colombia, Malawi, the Netherlands, Sweden, the US, and Vietnam. There was an independent uh, evaluation secretariat established outside of any existing organization. National reference groups and evaluation coordinators were established in the 22 participating countries that selected <coughs> national teams and a core evaluation team of members from uh, seven different uh, countries and in that regard they uh, represent an international group one of whom is there at the conclave Malika who helped found the Sri Lanka Evaluation Society and was its first president, was on the core international evaluation team for the Paris Declaration Evaluation. And I hope that those of you who are interested in it will seek her out. She can tell you a great deal more about it. And I want to personally thank Malika for facilitating my participation in the conclave, which she very much made possible. Um, and the Paris Declaration Evaluation received uh, the American Evaluation Association's 2012 Outstanding Evaluation Award. Um, so I urge those of you who are interested in it to, to take and, and have a look at it uh, and see the way in which it exemplifies what it means to do a, a joint evaluation. This diagram depicts the interactions among these various players and the challenge then, what this highlights and what I want to emphasize um, that I learned from getting involved in reviewing the Paris Declaration is that while we focus a great deal on evaluation methods and evaluation design and evaluation data collection and reporting, which are at the heart of our work, what stood out to me about the effectiveness of the success of the uh, joint evaluation of the Paris Declaration was the critical nature of the commissioning process, the management process, the governing process, the people who are involved in this behind the scenes, making it happen, raising the money, setting up the, the infrastructure for the evaluation, the underbelly, the skeleton of evaluation that's so invisible in much of our work is critical to being able to do high quality evaluations. And something that we need to, to pay more attention to um, and highlight. And the AEA award to the Paris Declaration included not only the evaluation team, but the management team and the commissioning team and the independent secretariat um, that made it all happen. The Paris Declaration 
as a joint evaluation was also based on the principles of the Paris Declaration mm -hmm. itself. Partner countries and mm -hmm. development partners followed the Paris Declaration and itself was accountable uh, for implementing the evaluation in accord with the Paris Declaration principles. So the principles provide an additional set of guideposts for how to conduct development evaluations. Nepal was involved in an important joint evaluation in 2003 and 2004 um, on the basic and primary education program in Nepal. And part of what emerged is when you get these multi-stakeholder joint evaluations with donors and partner countries and, and participants is that tensions emerge, um, including tensions between uh, stakeholder involvement and evaluator independence as we learn more about how to, how to do those. Um, tensions between country level ownership of the individual case studies of the 22 participants <coughs> and making those case studies useful in their countries but also conducting the 22 case studies in a template that was common so that there could be an international synthesis that was also critical to the way the evaluation was done. Um, and so the joint evaluations become part of doing the uh, understanding that the tensions that in, involved in any kind of evaluation get heightened in uh, large-scale joint evaluations, including tensions around purpose and use, tensions between the evaluation functions of evaluation for accountability and the functions for learning and improvement. And I found those tensions heightened in large-scale uh, developmental evaluations. Um, and so as we learn about conducting joint evaluations, we're also learning about the increased importance of multiple and mixed methods, triangulation and synthesis, the Paris Declaration evaluation used a large variety of different kinds of methods um, that were extremely important for the, the final credibility of the way that the evaluation um, was conducted. Um, and I want to call attention to an example uh, from UNICEF of the way in which a multi-methods and a multi-dimensional approach to examine child poverty and child well-being across several countries in the region uh, was recently conducted. It provides a deeper and more complete understanding of the deprivations uh, experienced by, by children. Looking at child poverty as opposed to household poverty is a relatively new approach. In 2007, the governmental work started when UNICEF launched the global study on child poverty and disparities with about 50 countries participating, the first time that countries in East Asia and the Pacific have systematically analyzed child poverty. And as Mahel Mahesh Patel said in his report, quote, a newly employed adult is likely to eventually find work. A child who does not eat enough will be stunted for life. A child who drops out of school will probably never resume their education. This kind of evidence requires an appreciation of multidimensional conceptualizations of these important dimensions. The same kind of multidimensional approach that Catherine talked about, uh, about assaults on women and, and violence against women. Um, and it challenges us as a field to be sure that we're using a variety and types of methods in this work. Um, in that regard, let me turn to another one of the challenges that, that I think are important for us to face. Um, and that is a, an important new development, and that is the use of visual data instead of simply words and numbers. And I want to share with you a favorite example that just, to me, encapsulates the power of visual data. Um, it's an example from the uh, introduction of a law requiring motorcycle helmets in Vietnam. On June 29 in 2007, the Vietnamese government uh, released Resolution 32, a decree that made it mandatory in Vietnam for all motorcycle drivers and passengers to wear a helmet on all roads beginning on the 15th December 2007. And uh, a 
agency involved in working on accident prevention um, in Vietnam went to a street corner in the heart um, of the city and took pictures both before and after the implementation of this law. So I want to show you those pictures uh, of the street corner before December 15, 2007 and the images that it evokes. This is a sign advertising the new law, um, the sale of helmets, a billboard announcing the new law, and the way in which the streets looked leading up to December 15, um, 2007. And then what it looked like after December 15, 2007, that morning, these images emerging. And it gives you a visual sense of the difference before and after that this law made. This kind of powerful data allows us to conceptualize um, the ways in which what's going on in the world visually has an impact. And they found that nearly 100% of Vietnam's motorbike users left home wearing a helmet on December 15, 2007. Um, it was an unbelievable sight. Uh, go back to that. It was an unbelievable sight, uh, he noted, um, with near instantaneous effect. And they tracked data showing a reduction in hospitalizations and a reduction in accidents. And so uh, one of the things that we're learning is the increased power of visual data. And it's going to be an important innovation um, as we move forward. Let me quickly then turn to a couple of other uh, important developments. Uh, capacity building, a major theme of the conclave, um, and this visual image of capacity building that gives us a sense of, of how important capacity building is and what it looks like. The work of UNICEF uh, has been important in this regard. And the Paris Declaration had a major a capacity building element to it. But the, I want to especially call out um, attention to the work that, that um, uh, Marco has done uh, in supporting capacity building. And when Marco Sigoni spoke to you early in the conference, um, he's been one of the leaders in making uh, capacity building a central focus of uh, the, the development of the profession, uh, as has the, the uh, better evaluation work side, the uh, work that's, that's gone on there in uh, creating a resource for the profession to use. Uh, all of these new resources that are emerging uh, that are critical to our capacity to uh, operate well going forward. So let me turn to a fourth major trend, and that is seen through a complexity lens. Um, the, in, the importance of systems thinking and complexity science as we learn how to do this, incorporating things like emergence, uh, dynamical interactions, adaptation, getting to maybe, uncertainty, unpredictability, uncontrollability, dealing with these dynamics, nonlinear kinds of uh, approaches, um, and contribution analysis instead of simply attribution analysis, where we can't do simple causal attribution in complex dynamic systems. In one of the most widely circulated Harvard Business Review articles um, of that journal's distinguished history, an article by David Snowden, the former director of knowledge management at IBM, and Mary Boone concluded that wise executives tailor their approach to fit the complexity of the circumstances they face. And there's a great deal of work going on in the multinational corporations around adapting to complex dynamic systems. And the lesson for evaluators is that wise evaluators tailor their approach to fit the complexity of the circumstances 
they face. And I want to pause here for a bit of a rant while I let this slide sink in to your inner consciousness. Because to be wise about complexity, you must be knowledgeable about what it is and is not, what it means and does not mean, what the implications are and are not. Like any concept that becomes popular and widely used, many who mouth words like complexity and system thinking are, unfortunately, ignorant about the implications for development evaluation, and I'm afraid, unaware of their own ignorance. Don't join them in that. I urge you to study complexity and systems thinking. The development evaluation implications are huge. And with greater knowledge and sophistication, you will undercome, come to understand, and here becomes the rant, why RCTs, randomized controlled trials, are inadequate, inappropriate, and actually distorting in complex development situations. You will come to understand how RCTs simplify, impose controls, and therefore oversimplify, essentially approaching complex dynamic systems most commonly, not always, but most commonly through mechanistic models, fixed, standardized, inflexible, <coughs> inflexible and non-adaptive interventions, and preordinate, independent, and dependent measures that produce results that are inherently static, artificial, non-generalizable, and not to put too fine a point on it, relatively useless when not actually distorted. All this despite rhetorical <laughs> flourishes about being evidence-driven, scientific, and a gold standard. Know that such claims are ideological and paradigm-based rather than methodological, justified, or appropriate. Though I acknowledge that such claims have been wildly successful in attracting money and prestige as a result of successful proselytizing, um, including claiming to deal with complexity while actually ignoring the real world dynamics of complex dynamic systems. Consider but one example I've recently come across from an advocate of RCTs who offered as an analogy for development interventions in complex situations taking an aspirin, which asserted this RCT advocate has been proven effectively effective in relieving headaches despite being a singular and simple intervention into a complex system, the human body. And it is true that on average, aspirin relieves headaches for many. It is also true that it is counterindicated for many, that it is useless for treating most migraines, that for others it can cause or aggravate ulcers and damage the stomach lining, that regular use and overuse are especially dangerous long term, that interactions with other drugs can be especially dangerous and counterindicated. Thus, the most appropriate use of this medical treatment analogy is to know that there are many possible treatments for a headache, not all of them by any means pharmaceutical, that determining which treatment or combination of treatments is appropriate requires knowing the medical history and the context of the person being treated, the type of headache being experienced, including frequency, duration, and severity, that other meds, what other meds are being taken, what other symptoms are being experienced, and trying out a particular pain reliever with careful attention to and monitoring possible side effects as well as actual ameliorative results. And this more complex framing of treating a headache is why the cutting edge direction in medical treatment at the world-renowned Mayo Clinic here in Minnesota is the new center for individualized medicine that emphasizes that context matters hugely. Family and medical history matter. Lifestyle and nutrition are part of context and situation analysis, as well as understanding multiple interacting symptoms and treatments, all of which must be observed, understood, and monitored on a case-by-case -case basis, accumulating in-depth, case-specific knowledge and understanding guided by a deep understanding of human beings as contextually situated and unique individual beings in complex relationships with each other and their environments. And that's why the Mayo Clinic for Individualized Medicine is where I go to be treated. Now, I suspect this rant will be controversial, perhaps even offensive to some. It is not an anti-RCT rant. It is a rant against treating RCT as a gold standard for impact evaluation. RCTs have their important and useful place among evaluation design options, but that place is not evaluating development interventions in complex dynamic systems. 
And let me add that I am not motivated by raising funds for an institute or trying to sell a particular approach to policymakers and evaluation funders. I am motivated by the desire to see our global profession become ever more sophisticated in adapting diverse methods appropriately to different situations, including the appropriate and sophisticated incorporation of complexity constructs and systems thinking and impact evaluation. That said, I do believe the professional development world would be well served by the creation and support for a center for contextualized development evaluation in complex dynamic systems. And now let me quickly move on to the final three twins, trends, uh, development evaluation through process use, which was a, uh, a huge issue in the, the Paris Declaration evaluation, um, in that it was not only important um, to do the Paris Declaration evaluation, but the evaluation became an intervention itself. As people in the country went around interviewing key informants and ministries about the implementation of the Paris Declaration, the most common question they got was, and just what is the Paris Declaration? And so the evaluation became part of a change mechanism. The Paris Declaration evaluation was itself evaluated by the DAC quality standards for development evaluation. Uh, I trust you're all aware of those. Um, and there's an extraordinary section in the technical appendix of the Paris Declaration evaluation where they systematically go through the DAC standards for development evaluation and look at how the Paris Declaration uh, measures up to each of those. And finally, the increased importance of meta-evaluation, which is how I came to know about the Paris Declaration, conducting the evaluation of the evaluation in preparation for uh, the high-level forum on development aid that took place in Busan, Korea in December of 2011, using a variety of evaluation methods for the, the meta-evaluation, producing an audit of the evaluation that appears at the beginning of the evaluation report and that was used to highlight the evaluation findings at the fourth high-level forum uh, on development aid in Korea in December of 2011. So these 10 trends, the globalization, our new frameworks, the importance of joint evaluations, multiple and mixed methods, use of visual data, capacity development, seen through a complexity lens, process uses, the DAC standards for development evaluation, and meta-evaluation are what I offer to try to capture some of the innovations going on in development evaluation and invite you to continue to share your observations about these important trends in development evaluation. Thank you very much. Thank you, Michael. So I'm going down to the floor now, and uh, those who have questions or comments, could you please come and join me? I'm going to ask you to keep them brief. We're going to do two rounds. Now's your chance. All right. One question, we'll take five. I wanted to know that uh, what is the your conclusion that why the governments have not been able to achieve the millennium development goals? Okay, we'll take a few more. Yeah, Michael, what do you think is the future trend? What will be the future trend of evaluation specifically uh, to improve the situation of those who are vulnerable? Uh, thank you. I'm Michael Donna Mertens. Um, just wondering, in doing the meta evaluation of the Paris Declaration, um, to what extent uh, the concerns were raised about um, issues related to gender and disability, and how that figured into um, meeting the goals. Thank you. Okay, um, let's go to the. There three. are. Are we going to take five questions, uh, or? Why don't you go ahead, Michael, with those those first three? Um, the I, I actually only heard the the last one, the the one on gender, and 
And the, the, Paris, the, the Paris Declaration evaluation does have a, a, a series of sub-questions on specific goals and objectives that are part of the development uh, evaluation and development aid that include uh, issues of, of gender, issues related to children, issues of uh, the welfare of women. So those are major components of the overall evaluation. If you would repeat the first two questions, Catherine. Okay, uh, let's do that too with the first questions. And could you also give your name, please? My name is Shahid. I am from Pakistan. I wanted to know that what are the main reasons that the, generally the governments have not been able to achieve their desired goals. It is because of ownership, because of financial constraint, because of uh, political will. Uh, what are your conclusions about that? Okay, and then I'm going over to Ganapati for his question to repeat it again. Yeah, uh, Michael, my name is Ganapati Oja. I am from Nepal. My question is uh, knowing your, your you know, views about the, the future trend in evaluation because the societies are being changed very in you know, the past. And, uh, and uh, as you mentioned, it is, um, the society is becoming also very complex. So in this situation, I, the, the, one of the questions I ask also that there are you know, differences in, 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 the, you know, in the, uh, the, the gender differences, cases, the inequality in gender, inequality in social, um, the, you know, social context. So in, in such a situation, uh, what do you think the evaluation should focus on? In future. Right, so the question from Pakistan being sort of what are the key blocks affecting governments in moving forward, and the question from Nepal on uh, uh, given these very vulnerable contexts, uh, the role that evaluation can play in, 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 in addressing some of these, these challenging trends. So, one of the questions I heard is. is uh, have not been able to uh, achieve their goals, um, and and I actually don't want to suggest that I have any special expertise about that. The obvious answer is the challenge of politics, but in fact, what we are learning um, and part of the development of our profession uh, has to be to understand that these kind of goals, like the Millennium Development Goals and the, the, the strategy goals of, of government, uh, are complex, are taking place in complex dynamic environments. Um, and the, the, the more challenging and inspirational uh, the goals are, the more difficult they're going to be uh, to achieve. Uh, it's worth keeping in mind, I think, that, that we're in the early learning curve of humanity uh, around trying to realize things like the Universal Declaration of, of Human Rights. It's only been in the last 50 years that the world has agreed that, that slavery is wrong, that women should be treated equitably, that the, that the, the poor uh, should have equal opportunities and, and care and, and support. Uh, these are huge uh, changes in the, the scope of human history. And so evaluation has to be part of learning how to help governments uh, and international uh, players achieve their goals. It's not going to happen uh, quickly. But if it happens at all, it will partly be because we play our role appropriately. I see another question here on what do you think, uh, uh, what do you think evaluation focuses on in different uh, contexts? The number one finding from the Paris Declaration evaluation was how much context matters. Uh, every presentation that, that the core evaluation team began, began with a slide that said context matters. So to understand the implementation of the, the Paris Declaration uh, principles in any given country, one had to understand the context of that country. To understand and the implementation in any given international agency. One had to understand the context of that agency. And it really highlights the importance for us as evaluators of being sensitive to context. Okay, uh, going to another question. Rashmi? Well, I'm Rashmi Agarwal. Another you. question you want to post or repeat? Yes, uh, we're just going to the question. Go ahead, Rashmi. Uh -huh. 
one of the things i could learn from your address that utilization of the evaluations is one of the major challenges i want you to enlighten us about it that at, especially at the policy level how it can be utilized thank you okay so question on the challenges of use of evaluation and particularly at the policy level if we don't have any other question okay we've got one more uh, question here i'll take another question Good morning. My name is Jagdish Pokhrel. I'm from Nepal. Uh, I have one question. In the process of conceptualizing the framework in the meta-evaluation, again, we might lose the details of the context. And probably they are more valuable than the aggregated ones that we come up with. What is your opinion uh, regarding the loss of the contextual details in meta-evaluation? Okay, so just reporting that, the, uh, again, coming back uh, and recapping that. So the tension between meta-evaluation, one of the trends you mentioned, and, uh, and being contextualized on the ground. So if there's not other questions, I'll go back to Michael. Wait, I'll take one more question. Good morning, Michael. I'm Romeo Santos from the Philippines. Uh, uh, would you agree with me that uh, whereas many people criticize RCT, uh, theory of change model or logic model as based on linear thinking, we still do not have a better alternative up, up to this moment. And maybe many of us would agree that uh, in the evaluation world, we haven't come up with an alternative of modeling the complex or complicated aspect of the social phenomenon. And uh, as an illustration, I think, uh, I would say this, that in social phenomenon, even complex and complicated, there are some linear aspects, and of course, multilinear aspect, pictorial aspect, such that, as an illustration, in mathematical problems, there are multilinear and linear problems. We apply linear problems, but that does not invalidate mathematics. So let me uh, try to take on uh, some of these uh, quickly. They're very important questions. I appreciate all of them, and they all deserve um, lengthy reflections. And I urge you to pose them to each other, not just to me, and continue the, the conversation. The challenges of using evaluation at the policy level, and uh, a, a really important uh, a question. And, and a part of what I think we have to get better at doing is um, training leaders and building the capacity of leaders at the policy level to use evaluation. We've learned that using information for decision making to inform decision making is not natural, um, it's not easy. One of the, the workshops that I regularly do now is workshops for leaders that's called reality testing, results oriented, learning focused leadership. And uh, with the support of uh, international agencies, with the support of philanthropy uh, and other sponsors of the evaluation, we're actually bringing together policymakers, senior managers, uh, leaders to learn how to use evaluation. There's a learning process. You can't just give them a report and think that they're going to make sense out of it. And the use has to be facilitated. So that becomes an important challenge to include in the contracts for evaluation and the scopes of work of working with policymakers to translate and implement results and facilitate their use. The question on the loss of context in, in meta uh, evaluations. Well, meta evaluations uh, need to, to be utilization focused in the same way that other evaluations are. So part of what was extraordinary about my experience with the Paris Declaration is I wasn't just brought in at the end. We've learned that in any evaluation, the evaluators need to be there from the beginning to really be able to be relevant, to be useful, to understand the context. And so I was brought in early in the second phase of the evaluation. I observed the international reference group meetings. I was present at management meetings. I observed the core evaluation team. 
uh, at work. I was able to do surveys of participants, uh, do interviews with people. Um, and so I invite you to look at the meta-evaluation of the Paris Declaration. Just Google it. It's also uh, available online. And see if the context uh, indeed was lost. Uh, because part of what I, I tried to do in that work was to maintain the global context as well as the country context uh, for the evaluation findings. And finally, a very big and huge question, given my rant about RCTs, is there a better uh, alternative to RCTs? Um, DFID has produced a, a report uh, on a number of alternatives uh, methods that can be used in complex dynamic systems. Um, there are people there at the, 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 the conclave who've been working on these issues, uh, like Patricia Rogers, Jim Rue, uh, who can share with you the work that's, that's being done that I don't have time to go into. But basically, um, uh, mixed methods, in-depth case studies, uh, looking at the uh, impact from multiple perspectives with different kinds of measures and data uh, with, with in-depth, contextually sensitive understanding of what the dynamics are of the systems in which impacts are occurring and how they affect each other. Uh, learning how to do systems mapping, learning how to do network analysis as a part of impact evaluation. Um, these new techniques are creating ways to understand complex dynamic systems that honor both complexity and dynamism and systems thinking. Um, and that, I think, is the future of dealing with impact evaluation uh, in a way that's true to complex dynamic systems in the development world. Thank you, Thank you for those great questions. Thank you so much, Michael. We've come to the end of the time. It's sort of raced by. So again, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, let, let me ask everyone to join now, me in thanking you for your keynote.